I'm on. Yeah. Good morning. How about a good morning back? Thank you. All right. As you can see up front, it will be a shorter lecture today. I just came from first session of a Provost seminar on teaching and the science of learning, and I'm going back over there to give a talk, and I have to be there at 11.20. So we're going to go for about an hour, and then you guys get to go. Uh, let's see. I hope you come on Thursday in the morning. Do whatever else you're going to do, maybe on that 17th later in the day. But come and do this Name That Scenario worksheet with me. I'm asking you to print it out and bring it. It will be more than just matching those five things. We'll talk about each of these in detail and some conditions and assumptions. It'll kind of form a good set of review place or notes for you for that exam too, which is coming up in a couple weeks. Homework six turned in Thursday at five o'clock and homework seven will go up on Thursday. That homework seven will be the last formal homework before your exam too. I'm going to be over in the league tomorrow also after I teach. So come on over if you want to investigate different majors or minors or just come say hi and ask me a STAT 250 question. But I'll be over there starting at 11 o'clock in the league. I think it's the ballroom, second floor for the concentration fair. And those are my main announcements. We'll have a couple clicker questions sprinkled throughout. First one's on the next slide. Do you have a question or comment? I hear lots of discussion. Do you have a question or comment at all? Otherwise, get your clickers out. Let's try our first question. Homework six is on paired. Homework seven and what we're discussing today. Which of these two options is this latest statistic that we've been studying and using? The statistic that has an approximate normal distribution again. Which leads us to our fifth scenario for inference. What is the latest statistic that we've been using to make a confidence interval, which we'll do today a couple times, that we'll use on Thursday to do a couple of hypothesis tests? I need the statistic. That's better, a little better. The statistic versus the parameter. And the statistic is A. The sample means versus the population means. Our fifth parameter is the difference between these two population means. That's the fixed unknown quantity that I'm trying to learn about. So I want to compare the true mean response for treatment one to the true mean response mu two for treatment two. I'll learn about that difference in the population means, the parameter, by taking my independent random samples, one from each population, and calculating the respective sample means, those statistics. And the difference in the sample means is my estimate of the difference in the population means. We spent our last lecture at the end deriving the two different confidence <coughs> intervals that are centered at that statistic, the difference in our sample means. And we go out a little bit each way from that best guess to form our confidence interval, our range of values that we think would be reasonable for that parameter. So let's revisit those two formulas that we derived because there were two different conditions or set of assumptions that would lead us to do one method versus the other. Page 151 of our notes is where we derived these ideas. And both of these formulas 
and any standard error expressions are on the yellow card, so you don't have to memorize them. But this first one was the general confidence interval, the basic interval constructed in the same way we've done other intervals. We took our best guess. We went out a few standard errors. There's what that standard error looks like. We derived that idea last time. But in this particular case, with that standard error, if you were to form that standardized quantity with that standard error on the bottom, it's not quite a t-distribution even. We know that if you put a standard error on the bottom, when you're doing means, that's what makes it a t statistic instead of a z. That if the true standard deviation could be on the bottom with the sigmas, you'd have the z. And even with this standard error on the bottom, it's not quite a t. It can be approximated with a t-distribution, so we can use approximate degrees of freedom to get this to work. The actual approximation that SPSS uses, and we'll see today, the degrees of freedom using an approximation done with the computer, is pretty complicated in terms of how they come up with it. So we'll let the computer do that work for us. If we have to make a confidence interval, this general one by hand, then I want us to use this conservative version where we find the smaller of the two degrees of freedom for each sample and use that as our degrees of freedom here to look up the multiplier. That'll give us an interval that might be, this is happening all day yesterday too during class. We'll try to ignore it. All right, the smaller the two degrees of freedom gives us an interval that's a little wider than it might need to be, but it's better than too narrow. The conditions that are needed for the general one are just two about the sample. Those have to be there. They need to be independent random samples. Two samples that are independent, not matched or paired, and both a random sample, representative. And then there's only one condition we have on those two populations that we took our samples from. The model for the response, your test scores, your reaction times, whatever it might be, that model for those responses in those two populations, each is a normal model, maybe different normal models because they might have a separate mu1 and mu2. Then we went on and developed what we called the pooled version on the next page. This pooled version of a confidence interval looks similar in structure, but we have a different standard error being put in. We get to move to that better standard error, that improved standard error, if we can assume one more thing about the populations. If not only you assume the population responses are normally distributed, maybe around different means, mu1 and mu2, because that's what we're trying to learn about, but that the variances or the standard deviations, those sigmas are equal, the same. If we can assume that, then we can take our standard error and improve on it by pooling the two S's together to get this SP quantity, the standard deviation, that's an estimate of this common population standard deviation, and update our standard error accordingly. And then when we use that form of a standard error, that structure with that standard error on the bottom is a T statistic with a T distribution. And that T distribution has larger degrees of freedom, N1 plus N2 minus the 2. And so this is our preferred result if we can use it, unless the data tells us you can't. So here are some guidelines to help us decide whether we use the pool that, we want, that we'd like to or whether we go back to the general if we can't. And then we'll try a couple practices out today. So page 153 has a pretty long list of ways you can decide to do pooled or unpooled. So we'll have to decide with two sets of data whether it's paired or independent first. And then we'll go back and say well, if they're independent, can we do the pool technique or the unpool technique? Now, most of the results you'll see in any kind of computer package is going to give you the unpooled and pooled version, both of them, unless it requires you to pick which one you want to do initially. In SPSS, it not only gives you both of these two results, but it also gives you a little pretest. It's called Levine's test, which is a little test that says you can more formally decide if you can assume equal population variances or not with this little test, which will give you a p-value to help you make that decision. The null hypothesis in this Levine's pretest is that the population variances are equal. 
So this initial hypothesis is testing that the variances are equal. It's not the test about the means that we would be doing for the primary inference, but this little pretest says, let's step aside and say, can we assume the variances are equal, yes or no? And if H0 is that the variances are equal and HA is that they're not equal, then what would a small p-value versus a large one tell us to do? Small p-value means reject H0. Rejecting H0 says can't assume variances in the populations are equal. So if you get a small p-value here, you would have to say can't pool. It would be telling you strongly that the data says not reasonable to say the variances in the populations are the same because your sample variances were too different and therefore you don't pool. So here's an example of a test where we're kind of hoping the p-value is big. Because if it is large enough, then we say there's not enough evidence to reject equal variances. And that would allow us to go on and do the more powerful technique called the pooled conference interval or testing. So we'll see that, and you're going to see that in your, um, I think it's lab module 7, actually, 7 or 8, I can't remember. All right, we'll see an example of that in our first uh, working today. And then, of course, we want to look at our data graphically. A very good graph would be the box plots side by side. The IQR is the length of the boxes in those box plots. That's a measure of spread or variability. So if the IQRs, the length of your boxes, were somewhat comparable, then you would be able to say it looks like equal variances for the populations would be reasonable. They don't have to be exactly the same. They just have to be comparable. So we'll take a look at that as another way of helping us decide. And of course, as is guided in your textbook, we're going to be looking at those sample standard deviations. We're going to be hoping that those two S's that were calculated in our two sets of data are comparable in size, that they aren't markedly different. Then I can assume common population variance. Then I can pool. Now, the pooled and unpooled standard errors can be the same when you have equal sample sizes. So the advantage is mainly that the degrees of freedom are going to be helping us have a more precise interval. Larger degrees of freedom gives us a smaller T star and a narrower interval. If the standard deviations don't seem to be close enough, then you can see whether you have a problem or not because if the sample sizes are different, you expect things to go together. A large sample size should lead to a larger standard deviation. And a small sample would tend to lead to a smaller standard deviation. And if that's the case, then even pooling would be still okay to do because we'll have slightly conservative results. But if you get the opposite, where the large sample gave you this really tiny variability, that's not what you expect. And if you do pooled, you can get an interval that looks like it doesn't contain zero when it really would have, and you'd reach a wrong conclusion. So we're going to go through this checklist um, each time we come to a new scenario to decide if we're going to pool or not. Bottom line is we're going to hope we can pool. We'll look at those sample standard deviations. Your textbook has a nice rough rule of thumb, and we'll use it. It's not one that works universally for all sample sizes, but it's not bad. If those two S's, you look at them, if one of them's more than twice the other, that's when they're starting to be quite different. Because, you know, you can change your units and you change the standard deviations to look either bigger or smaller. But we'll take that as sort of a rough rule of thumb. So let's try it out. Two examples today. One with output, so the calculations are much less. One without output. A little more calculation. This is a study comparing reading scores for students. A group of the students were taught with certified teachers and the others were taught with uncertified teachers in terms of reading. We have the results for 10 students assigned to each of these two groups. And mu1 and mu2 here are our population parameters that are defined for us. Mu1 is a mean or average, average reading score for the population of all students that are taught by the certified teachers and likewise for that other population if they had been taught by uncertified teachers. And this is a classic output that tells you you're doing a two independent samples t-test. Because what does it say right here? Independent samples instead of paired. If you remember the paired output, looking at that, it says paired samples test results. And we can pull from this output different things we need to either do a test or a confidence interval. 
you're almost always given the group statistics up front. This is sort of your classic data setup. And looking at the results of our samples, did it look like the certified teachers tended to lead to students getting a higher average reading score? Group number one had a higher mean, 34 versus a 28. So descriptively, it looks like the certified teachers led to having a better reading score on average for students compared to those that were uncertified. Those are our two sample means, and these are our two sample standard deviations right next to it. There's S1 and S2. Now certainly I should look at those two values to decide if I think I should pool or not for creating my confidence interval that I want to make here. That's one direct um, information coming from the data to help us decide. Now are those going to ever be the same? <coughs> Never. I, I really don't expect them to ever be the same. Even if the population variabilities, the population variances are identical, you're taking samples. And if you take samples, you're going to get variability and they aren't going to give you the exact value that your populations had. And so these are not going to be exactly the same. Just because they are different in any way does not mean I have to do unpooled. Are they similar? Similar size, 9 and 7. Now, here's the idea again. Remember we said if you're having one that's more than twice than the other, then you're starting to get kind of in that range of maybe they're different enough. And 9 and 7, pretty close. 9 and 70, very different. All right, let's take a look at that then and also comment on this Levine's test that we're going to comment on next. So we have to assume equal population variances if we want to do the pooled. Let's look at our sample standard deviations, which we just did, and comment on this pretest called Levine's test. So number one, S1 of 9.1 is similar to the second standard deviation, which was about seven. So that's a plus for pooling. And how about this other information that's available in this particular output? Look at the output in the independent samples test section. Before you get to your standard errors and things that you might use for doing a t-test and so on, there's that Levine's test sitting out there for you. Levine's test for, what does it say? Equality of variances. It is testing for us as a pretest that the two population variances are the same. The sigma 1 squared the same as sigma 2 squared. And so there's this test. And there's a statistic here. It's called an F statistic, which we're not going to worry about because I'm not going to show you the background on that yet. We'll do that in a little later class. But I know you can do the p-value. You know how to use a p-value to decide between a null and alternative hypothesis. The rule for using that p-value is the same no matter what kind of test was done. If the p-value is small, you reject the null. This p-value is 0.751. So what do we do? We stay with H0. P-value is 0.751 for Levine's test implies we fail to reject that null hypothesis of equal variances. What does that imply then? These two together give us evidence that we can do what? <coughs> Unpooled or pooled? Now you guys are all quiet. Pooled. <coughs> the two sample standard deviations weren't markedly different. The little test that helps me decide if they're close enough, more formally, with this p-value, huge p-value says, stay with H0. You're not going to refute it. So we get to use the pool technique, which is a preferred technique in terms of precision in your confidence interval, in terms of power in your test. Now the output provides you two rows. The first row is equal variances assumed. That first row of information then going on further is the pooled techniques, the test or the confidence interval that we'll be pulling out. And the bottom one is the unequal variances. Equal variance is not assumed. That's the unpooled or general method. So SPSS automatically will do the t-test and start working out the confidence interval stuff for you for both methods 
you have to decide which one you're going to pull out. So we'll talk about t-tests for this scenario on Thursday, but for now we're going to use the equal variances assumed, come down here and use this mean difference, that's the difference in our sample means of six points, and that's standard error to make our confidence interval with this degrees of freedom of 18. The unpooled version has degrees of freedom of what here? 16.9. This was using this Welch's approximation that's a bit difficult to work with in long form. So we're going to be using the pooled technique here. Let's make a 95% confidence interval to estimate the difference in the population mean reading scores. So I need the difference in my sample means as a first best guess. And then I will be able to go out plus or minus a few standard errors, and I get to do the pooled standard error. So there's that basic structure. There's a huge formula behind this pooled standard error, but the pooled standard error is already calculated in the pooled row under standard error for the difference in your sample means. We also have our two sample means of 34 and 28, and that mean difference is six points. Six-point descriptive difference, we'll do a plus or minus, I'll have you look up a T star. The pool standard error here is how much? 3.642. Now what do you notice about the pooled standard error compared to the unpooled one? It's the same. Mm -hmm. It will always be the same if your sample sizes are the same. Algebraically, you could show the general standard error is equivalent to the pooled one if the n's aren't an n1 and n2, but just a common n, same sample size. So we don't gain there. The standard error is not going to be smaller if we do pooled. But the degrees of freedom will be larger. Does the 18 degrees of freedom make sense with that rule that we have, n1 plus n2 minus 2? Degrees of freedom, n1 plus n2 minus 2 is... 20 minus 2 or 18. So with 18 degrees of freedom, let's look up our T star. 95% level of confidence, 18 degrees of freedom, and our multiplier will be what? A little more than 2. Two point one zero from my table A2. Go out a little more than two standard errors, and we'll have our margin of error. Margin of error is about 6.75. So what does that give us for an interval? Goes down to a negative, 1.64. And all the way up to more than 13. We would estimate the difference in the population mean reading scores, certified minus uncertified, to be anywhere from a negative 1.6 points all the way up to possibly 13.6 points. So we have a clicker question to answer in part C. You use your interval to make some inference. Here's a range of reasonable values for the difference in the true means. Every value in that interval is reasonable. You would have to accept it, not reject it. With that in mind, of course, we're trying to decide. Our certified teacher is significantly better in the sense of bringing up those reading scores on average. So our question says, based on our interval, does there appear to be a difference? in the mean reading scores for our two populations, students. Does there appear to be a difference? What are you looking for to see if it's in the interval or not? Zero. So check with your neighbor to see if you come up with the same conclusion. We can see that zero's in the interval, but what does that mean? Should you click yes or should you click no? 
right, does there seem to be a difference? Let's see what you're saying. Most of you are saying no, no difference, and that is because zero's in the interval. If zero's in the interval, zero is possible for mu1 minus mu2. So mu1 minus mu2 could be equal to zero. You could not refute that. You could not reject this theory that mu1 and mu2 are the same. The data does not reject that theory. And that means there doesn't seem to be a difference. Even though most of the values were positive, even if your interval goes just a tiny bit below zero, zero is still in that interval. And at a 5% level of significance, matching with our 95% confidence, we would have to stay with H0 here, that the two population means are the same. We could not reject that theory. There does not seem to be a significant difference between the two mean reading scores for our two populations based on our data. Good. So we've actually already informally done a test of hypotheses here too, the two-sided one. Let's take a look at one more example today. And this is based on the Stroop's word color test. Have you ever done this test before? Yes, yeah, some? Where you have 100 words, they're all names of colors but they're shown in colors that are different than their name. And you have to correctly identify the display color. All right? and do that as quick as you can. The time to complete this particular test is going to be recorded as a way of measuring a person's ability under two different conditions. Group one, some, consumed some alcohol. Group two, had a placebo drink instead. 16 individuals in each. We balanced with respect to gender, so we actually blocked by gender to make sure that the two groups were balanced in that way, and we have our results. So we have an experiment comparing the average time to complete the test for our two groups. Let's have you try it out first. Ready? So we're supposed to identify the display color. Okay, not too bad now. Try it on Thursday, right? <laughs> After we have our class together. <laughs> or just wear green. That's fine, too. Here's our results. Did it take the alcohol group longer on average to complete this task? Yes, about almost 14 seconds longer on average. Not second. Yeah, is it seconds? I think it's seconds. All right. Here's our data. This is your classic two independent sample setup. Without more information, you could not do a pair design. Because a pair design would need all of the differences. A pair design would need you to calculate every difference, like you have to do on your homework problem number one, five differences, and then take those differences and average them to get D bar, and take those five differences, here 16, but five, and get your standard deviation. I've had a few students ask me, how do I get SD, your standard deviation of your differences, for that first homework question? That's just your S, your sample standard deviation on those five differences. So go back to chapter two, where we learned about S, and how we calculated for our French fry data set back then. Same thing on your differences there from other daughters. But here we don't have that information. I cannot get S sub D from this information. I can get D bar if this were a paired design by subtracting those two sample means. It is true, we've learned, that the mean of the differences is the difference in the means. So I could get that aspect back, but the standard deviation of the differences does not come from those two standard deviations there directly. You actually have to calculate those differences. So we do have independent samples. We're told to assume they are both random samples. We are told that we can assume the model for our variable, time, is normally distributed for each population. Our first question, though, is how would we examine that condition? What would we look at to verify that that assumption is reasonable? 
So you've got a couple of choices here for a next clicker question as to which graphs you would make. Pick one out of the set that I've got here that would help you check that normality condition. Even though we're told it seems to be okay, what graphical technique, though, would you use to make that decision? So we're going to have clickers for A and E in this problem. And here are a couple choices. On exam two, you might be asked to state the condition that is needed to do that technique, or you might be given some graphs to help you assess those conditions. You might be given a graph and asked, what condition are you checking with that graph? Can you state that condition correctly? Which ones? You can only pick one. Not too bad. We have a couple choices here that should not be selected and a couple that could be. Most of you are picking the tool that refines that checking of normality, the QQ plot, which would be good to do. A few of you checked a histogram, which would also be okay. But what is a bar chart or a pie chart used for? It displays a distribution, but for these two are for categorical data. A bar chart is not a histogram. A bar chart is the categorical display. QQ plots and histograms. How many would you have to make? If you're going to make a QQ plot, would you make one or two? You have two sets of data that are independent samples. They're supposed to each respectively come from a population that's normal, maybe with different means. Mu1 and mu2 might be different. That's what we're trying to learn, if they are different or not. So we are supposed to make two separate QQ plots, not one large one of all 32 observations. With the data, the way it's set up in most computer packages, this data set were in SPSS for you to analyze, it would have all 32 times in one column. It would have another column, which is that grouping variable, 1, 1, 1, 1, 2, 2, 2, 2. So it's really easy to make the wrong graph. So if you ask to make one for that homework 7, make sure you split your file by your grouping variable. So you get one for each. All right, QQ plots and histograms would both be fine to look at here. We're told we can go ahead and go on, but then what? will we make? So let's take a look at our data descriptively first and then make our appropriate confidence interval. We made a couple comments already. Let's do one of them again. What about the alcohol group here? They descriptively took longer. Just describing the results, the alcohol group took nearly 14 seconds longer. on average compared to the placebo group. What else do you notice about the responses for group one versus group two? Looking at those standard deviations, which group had more variability in their results? Group number one. The alcohol group also had more variability in their completion times. Our standard deviation of 22.6 versus 12. So which procedure would we use here? We only have one set of information that helps us make that decision directly, and that is those two standard deviations right there, the 22 and 12. They are not the same. They're a little more different than our last one, right? Getting closer to that rule of double one of them and you get the other, then that's starting to be maybe a little bit different. So without any more information, you might be hesitant to say we should go ahead and pool. I mean, there's not just a fine rule that says as soon as it's more than twice, you should not pool. There's, you know, it depends on a lot of different things. So I will typically give you on an exam more than one indicator. And those two indicators would typically line up and not be um, inconsistent so that you would choose the appropriate procedure. For here, let's try then the unpooled method just to have that example in our notes too. And then we'll take a look at the results if you had done it pooled. If researchers had said, yes, we feel it's fine to pool with their background knowledge and see whether the results would even differ. 
So our statement here of pooled versus unpooled, perhaps we'll do unpooled at this point since the S1, which is 22.6, is a bit larger than the S2. The two sample standard deviations are not as close to reflect that assumption as readily. So let's try perhaps the unpooled method at this point. And we only have the data summarized here, so we'll have to do a little calculation. The unpooled confidence interval at a 95% level. So here's the formulas again. They are on your yellow card. You don't have to memorize them. But we do have to sometimes plug in the different pieces and look up perhaps a multiplier. That 113 minus the 99 gives us that almost 14 seconds. It's 13 point was it 13.88? And we'll need a T star in a moment. We'll talk about what that will be with its degrees of freedom. And then the standard error will have to be computed too. Now, tell me what I'm doing wrong. you have underneath that square root the sample variances over the sample size, S squared over the N1. And it can be easy to drop those squares or forget a square root where it's needed. So we do have to square those. In some old exams, you might see that column not being the sample standard deviations, but the sample variances. So the sample variances are given to you. Again, you look at them to see if they're comparable or not. But then you would just plug those numbers in and not have to square them again. But we often are summarizing data with the standard deviations. So this takes a little bit of work to get that standard error. And then what about this T star? What degrees of freedom will we use? So unpooled requires either this approximation, which is called Welch's approximation, that the computer would do for us. Even your calculators typically would too, which may not even give you a whole number. But if we're doing it by hand, we're going to be conservative and do the route of the smaller of the two degrees of freedom. Degrees of freedom for the first sample is 15. Degrees of freedom for the second sample is 15. The smaller of those is 15. So we use the smaller of 16 minus 1 or 16 minus 1. We'll use 15 degrees of freedom and look up our multiplier. 15 degrees of freedom with 95% level again is a what? Two point one, three. And putting that all together, let's see, the standard error would turn out to be 6.41, just for that intermediate step. The full margin of error, the full plus or minus part, ends up being about 13.58. So going 13.88 plus or minus this 13 and a half gives us our range of reasonable values for our difference in our population means. It starts out at about 0.3 and goes all the way up to what, 27. Twenty-seven point four six. There's our range of reasonable values for this difference in population means. Last clicker question, part E. You could be asked again to interpret this interval or interpret the confidence level that's attached to that interval. Would you be able to interpret that confidence level? You've done that a few times. All you really have to change out is the parameter that you're hoping will be in your interval here. And in our case, we would say what? If we repeated this whole experiment again and again and again, 16 subjects, balance by gender, et cetera, get our confidence interval every time, which will be slightly different from one experiment to the next. What do we know about that collection of intervals? They won't all be good. They won't all have the correct thing in them, but we expect 95%. 
of those intervals to have, in this case, not p, not mu, but the difference in the population means, the difference in the population mean times for group 1 versus group 2. Here we have our interval that allows us to make a conclusion about whether there is a difference or not. And our clicker question says, based on our interval, can we conclude the population means for our two groups are different? I'm really asking you to do that at a 5% level of significance to match up. And what would we say? Do they seem to be different, those two population means? Similar to the question we asked a little earlier, but that interval had zero in it. Here we're seeing zero is not in our 95% confidence interval. Most of you are correctly selecting yes. If zero's not in your interval, zero's not reasonable. If zero's not reasonable, we would say that mu1 does not seem to be equal to mu2 because their difference does not seem to be equal to zero. If zero's not in the interval, I would not accept zero as a reasonable value for the difference. So there does not seem to be a significant difference, or there does seem to be a significant difference. All right, we have done a hypothesis test in some sense there. We'll talk about the pooled t-statistic versus the unpooled t-statistic on Thursday. Would you remember to bring your name that scenario on Thursday?